is Rory O'Toole. And my name is Matt Schultz. And this is How to Be. The podcast where we discuss ancient wisdom, modern hacks, paperback self-help books, and pithy platitudes. In the hopes of figuring out the best way to live this one precious and wild life. Do you like to follow the leader? Are you a sucker for a man in uniform? If so, join us as we discuss authority. Okay, so as you know, I just spilled my wine here inside my recording fort. This little wine always has to be drinking in order to record this podcast. I think it makes me charismatic, like Fun Bobby. (laughs) Fun Maddie. Remember Fun Bobby? Of course I do. That's a friend reference, people. Did you see Jennifer Aniston's birthday post? From Gwyneth Paltrow? No, she posted it. She posted her own birthday post. I think so. What did it say? It was just pictures of her through the years with this audio about how when you turn a new age, you're actually still every, you're like a nesting doll of ages within ages. Oh, interesting. It was like a speech someone was saying? Yeah, I I imagine that someone else made a TikTok. Yeah. It was like audio from that TikTok and it must have become like a trend to like use that. Yeah. Audio with pictures of yourself. Yeah. That's a nice sentiment. I thought it was sweet and it made me appreciate Jennifer Aniston. (laughs) Do you think you underappreciated her before? No, but I haven't been thinking about her for the past two months. (laughs) I had that period where I was really obsessed with her for a minute. I, you know, I also love Jennifer Aniston. And her commitment to being one color, which I think we've talked about on this show. Yes. Low contrast human being. Hair, skin, eyes? No, I think she has blue eyes. Yeah. They're not breaking up the one color, though. No, no. So what I wanted to ask is me spilling my wine. Was that spill preordained? Written into the very fabric of the Big Bang? Um, Well, that's a heavy question. In this dimension, yes, but not in the other dimensions. There's a dimension where you didn't spill your wine. Really? There's a dimension where you spilled a bottle of wine. There's a dimension where wine doesn't exist. <laughs> I don't <laughs> see. I don't believe that because like, according to that theory, it's like, OK, so they're like in this dimension that we live in, like my actions, all, it's not like each decision I make is completely siloed from the other ones it's like life is of a piece so why would there be some universe in which i go out and kill someone tonight because i don't know but if there's infinity universes with infinity options it could all be possible right all the unfoldings all the different okay that's a slightly different theory so there's the theory that There's just so many universes that everything that could theoretically arise, arises. And then there's the theory of the sliding doors theory, really, that every time we make a decision, it splits. I'm like, no, it, I was never going to, you know, I was never going to go see the English patient instead of sack lunch. Like I was always going to see sack lunch. <laughs> like there is no universe in which I go see the English patient. <laughs> um. Well, what about the universe where the English patient isn't even made into a movie? Yeah. The, uh, and again, that's the infinite universes theory versus yeah. the splitting, splitting ends. They aren't the same. No, I don't think so. Mm. I think One is just like, there's so many universes that eventually you'll make one that's almost exactly like this one, except one thing is different. Yeah. Versus the idea that every time we make a decision, we create a new universe. I see. I see. Like two roads diverged in a yellow wood. Yeah. 
Oh my gosh. I prefer the uh, former, not the latter. Yeah. Too much pressure. Too much pressure. I wouldn't mind a universe in which the expression former and latter doesn't exist. I find it very confusing. Oh my gosh. Is that an insult? Are you insulting me? No, no. I just find it confusing. I'm insulting myself. Criticizing me? (laughs) I have to, every time I hear the former and the latter, I have to think back to summer camp when I was in a production of Damn Yankees at Camp Micah. And this girl who I thought was really talented, I was blown away by her talent. She sings, a little brains, a little talent with an emphasis on the latter. Um, and she does sort of a seductive move there, like the talent. Talent is, yeah, I find latter and sexuality. former easier when they're together because former is pretty obvious. They both mean the same thing. Former and no, latter means later. Ladder means later. Oh, maybe that could help you. Yeah, Latter Day Saints. <laughs> yeah, I recently looked up why they're called Latter Day Saints. I think it's because, like, it's about later biblical, like, they think the story kept unfolding. Right, right. Later day. Later, later day. Um, Wait, you said something interesting. Oh, I wonder what happened to that girl. Do you remember her name? Have you ever Googled her? No, I don't remember her name. Okay. Um, But yeah, I remember watching her and being like, she's got it. (laughs) Sexual (laughs) charisma. Oh, now we're so old. She's probably just married and a mom. And You don't think she's on Broadway? Maybe. Still doing damn Yankees. Maybe she's still doing damn Yankees at Camp Micah. Maybe she works at Camp Micah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder where she is. Um, okay. Camp friends. Did you have close camp camp friends? No, I'm not like I didn't have that Jewish American experience. I did. I only went to camp for three years. I I had camp I, I was a camp girl. Really? Yeah. Which is something that people can't quite conceive of me. Yeah, it doesn't Does not my picture. Track. Where do kids in Chicago go to camp? Wisconsin. Oh, uh, the place where the summer camps are is different yeah. for children everywhere. And that was my first exposure to the Jewish community. Well, was it a Jewish camp? <laughs> no, but a lot of people there were Jewish. What is that about Jewish people in summer camp? I don't know. Because I saw this like person on the street interview in New York where this girl goes up to people and asks them a series of questions to determine if they're Jewish or not. And one of the, I've seen that. Yeah. One of the questions is, did you go to summer camp? Mm, Yeah. She can't just ask, did you go to Jewish summer camp? That would be a cheat. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, it's a huge part of Jewish culture. I think Jewish parents are always looking for ways to instill Judaism in their kids that don't involve them having to do it themselves. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, also this camp was theater camp, which is very Jewish, too. A Jewish art form. Mm, Yes, the Yiddish theater. (laughs) Anyway, before that, I went to Bible camp. Quite the opposite. You know, I actually went to a Christian camp before I went to Jewish camp. Oh, really? Yeah, it was a YMCA camp, and we had, like, this chapel with a cross made out of birch wood, which I thought was quite beautiful. Oh, nice. Um... Yeah, and then at Jewish summer camp, I really had a religious awakening. Oh my God, really? Yeah, I really, I would look at the sky and just talk to God. Is that the beginning of your religion for you, you think? No, because then there was a disconnect. But I remember looking out at like the lake and being like, this is so beautiful. Like there has, this has to be proof of God. It's so beautiful. Hmm. But then I was like, maybe humans just think everything is beautiful. And I tried to picture one thing that wasn't beautiful in nature, and I couldn't picture anything. I was like, it must just be human bias for nature. What about like a one of those big spiders? Ugh, they are kind of beautiful, though, but ugh. no, no, no. Those centipedes, centipedes are not beautiful. Ugh. Yeah, yeah. So. 
I don't know what I was trying to prove, though. Everything being beautiful also seems like a proof of God. Yeah. Or it seems as much like a proof of God as it seems very non-conclusive to me at this point. (laughs) Really, I feel like the more, the older I get, nature is the only reason I think God exists. Oh, you know what I thought about today that made me think God must exist? Evaporation. Think of where we would be if water didn't evaporate. (laughs) It's sustainability. God is the original sustainability director. It's amazing. And nothing else evaporates. Imagine if other things evaporated. That would be terrible. Honey, where's the remote? (laughs) It became the ceiling. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, like water is specifically the thing we need to like make itself scarce every once in a while. Well, we need it to become water again. Yeah. We need it to become water again. We need it to get out of our towels so we can use them again. Yeah. We need when it rains for it to dry up. It's that that's got to be God. It's got to be God. Otherwise, there could be no life on Earth that wasn't just fish. Have you has your bed dried out a little bit because the weather's been more dry. Okay. Well, you know, this is a good segue, I think. God, the ultimate authority. I just want to say that was a reference to something I told Rory in a previous episode, if you didn't hear it, about my bed being wet because it's so humid in Israel right now, Um, not because I wet the bed. (laughs) In case anyone was confused, (laughs) I wanted to clear that up. Yeah. Um, anyway, this is a good segue. God, the ultimate authority. And that's what we're mm-hmm. talking about today. Respecting authority. Yes. What does authority... I like to start every episode by asking you for a definition, Matt. What does authority mean? Do you do Often. that? Often. Yeah. Maybe you okay. should be listening to the episodes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. What is authority? Authority is in any sort of hierarchical arrangement of human beings Mm -hmm. authority Mm -hmm. is the power those in the rung above you have to tell you what to do and what not to do and it can be it can be determined by many different things it can be determined by the voluntary agreed upon rules of that organization of people like if you join a club Mm-hmm. And there's some sort of authority structure. It can be determined just by might. A well, bully. actually, I liked one of these definitions of authority because it brings that into it. It says authority is the exercise of legitimate influence by one social actor over another. There are many ways in which an individual or entity can influence another to behave differently. And not all of them have equal claim to authority. So. For example, a mugger on the street could take all your stuff, take your money, and they would be exerting power over you through might, but they don't have legitimate authority like the tax man taking all of your money from you. But what about someone like Hitler? Well, Hitler was elected to office, so yes, he had legitimate But then he he used the levers of democracy to de-democratize the country. We can say that dictators exert illegitimate authority. Um, Also, they, you know, they violate inviolable human rights. But I I still think we think of them as authority figures. It's almost like if, if the authority figure comes up with some sort of system of rules, even if the system of rules is illegitimate, but there's something formal I think there's something exactly. Yes. I don't think it it really comes down to legitimacy so much as formality. Well, I guess what is legitimacy? It could be Uh, everyone's going to have a different definition. Yeah. Oh, here. Max Weber identifies three inner justifications or sources of legitimacy for the exercise of authority. Wow. We have Max Weber's definition right here. One, okay. traditional norms sanctified by longstanding convention. Okay. 
Two, charisma, which attracts the personal confidence and devotion of followers. And three, rational legal consideration supported by belief in the validity of legal status and functional competence. Much of the authority cited in organizations rests on rational legal source of authority. Okay, I think we're, yeah, I think I think authority can be illegitimate also and still be authority. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that if everyone is paying tribute to the mob boss, he's got some authority. Well, he's got charisma. Even if he didn't. And also within the mob, traditional norms sanctified by longstanding con convention could make the bob mob boss the big kahuna in the room the one they respect this is a new mob they just opened <laughs> okay <laughs> well i think he has more precarious authority then yeah but either way wh where does authority come into your life obviously your husband has dominion over you yeah that's that's true. your most immediate source higher <laughs> that's your most immediate supervisor yeah, and that's authority ordained by God. You know, I must yeah. admit. Um, you know, I am a pretty obedient person. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of following rules that have purpose, not meaningless rules, not punitive, but I believe in the importance of um authority. And it actually I find it quite scary when people flagrantly um disobey. The authority figure like so I've been thinking a lot about authority as sort of social contract, which is everyone has to buy in or most people have to buy in to give that person authority. So, for example, in a classroom, the teacher has the authority. But haven't we all been in a classroom with a few bad apples who laugh in the face of the teacher's authority? And nothing mm -hmm. is scarier to me than that. Because it's almost like it reveals the precarious nature or the meaninglessness or that there's no there there with the teacher's authority, especially since they got rid of corporal punishment in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's frightening. Um, you know, there's a Jewish saying, pray for the welfare of the government, for without it, people would eat one another alive. Mm -hmm. Now... That, you know, there's all these sort of Enlightenment era ideas about um, the pre-societal pre man. Um, and one of them is this idea of, you know, all against all mm -hmm. and life being, what is it, short, nasty, brutish, something like that. There And there are other thinkers who believe, no, like people, like we actually don't need these hierarchical systems. Like people are actually good at cooperating in these hierarchical systems. Like this is what like an, an, an anarchist would say. He'd be like, no, we don't need these hierarchies of power. People can cooperate on equal footing. That's certainly, you're right. That's not what it feels like in the classroom when the substitute teacher shows weakness. Yeah, I mean, have you ever had like a, just a, a teacher who's overrun by a class? It's like, and then you just feel, then you actually feel bad for the teach, for the teacher, and then that's a really weird position to be in because it's like, wow, I have no faith. <laughs> yeah, I've been that teacher. I've been that teacher where you're like, I have no power. There's nothing. They've figured it out. Yeah, They've exactly. They figured out that it's fake. <laughs> and my words now mean nothing, and my threats are empty. I've got yeah, nothing. Like, I was read an article in New York Magazine about um, these kids, like teenagers who just won't go to school, mm -hmm. and there's just nothing their parents can do. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> so much of it rests on just this sense that like, when your mom is counting to three, you don't want her to get to three. It's it's unbelievable. It's like they they laugh in the face uh, of your performance as an authority figure. Yeah, you know, there's an old episode of South Park 
where one of the kids becomes his like rebellious and his parents recognize that he's become ungroundable. That's the thing. What are you going to do? If you can go without. Yeah. Because like all you can do is take away privileges. But can you even? And there's this beautiful short story by Edgar Carrot, who's an Israeli writer, about this kid and he's being bullied by these other kids at the school. And they steal a bike from the janitor, who's a Holocaust survivor. And he tells on them. Mm -hmm. They get in trouble. And then they're coming to like beat him up for ratting. And all of a sudden, the Holocaust Day Remembrance siren goes off, which is a siren that sounds in Israel, and you're supposed to stand quietly. And they freeze. They become like statues because they, because the siren. And he realizes that he can just walk away from them. He doesn't have to freeze. Mm. So they're sort of, it's, 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 it's such a beautiful moment of freedom when he realizes that they're caught in this amber. You know, they don't actually respect the Holocaust. They stole this guy's bike, but they're unthinking morons. So they're trapped in this like beam of silence and stillness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's free. It's, it's, it's beautiful. And he just trots off. And that's how the story ends. Well, that's actually something I wanted to talk about. The authority of, of symbols. So like mm. the stop sign has such authority over me. Yes. You know, it's like I could be driving in a completely uh, as far as the eye could see. No people, no police. But if I come to a stop sign, I'm going to stop because that stop sign has authority. I think I trust the stop sign more than I trust myself. What's the point of the stop sign to make sure people don't get hurt? Right. I can see. Mm -hmm. I can just go through the stop sign. No one's around. I can see that there's no one around. But the stop sign says there might be someone around. You have to stop. I believe yeah, the stop sign knows. Yeah, it's really drilled into us. Um, so this is something I want to ask. Yeah. The handicapped bathroom. Obviously, the handicapped spot has absolute authority. Yeah. No one dare touch it. <laughs> no. The handicapped you, bathroom, what yours? level of authority does that have? I just want to say, if you were parking in a handicapped spot as a non-handicapped person, I don't want to know you. Because that is like, that is just a middle finger in the face of social rules and customs. Because we and all agree that it is like a sacred spot for only the handicapped. It's, yeah, it's... It's not something like we may have a moment of hesitation outside the handicapped bathroom where we go, could I? Should I? No one's doing that with the spot. With the spot, we all understand. We don't even think about it. Now, with the handicapped bathroom stall, I didn't even know that that was something that you should not use until a Curb Your Enthusiasm episode. Really? Where, I don't remember yeah. that one. Where it's, um, he's in the handicapped bathroom and someone in a wheelchair comes in and you we all know what happens um uh, so i often use the handicap stall i do too not i don't know i did it's never come up for me now i avoid it right i will use the other stalls first but yeah but the corollary situation of like i'm having trouble finding a parking spot you still would never use the spot even right. if there were no other spots Whereas the bathroom, if the other stalls are taken, you go, okay. Because you, everyone has to wait for the bathroom, even if you're handicapped. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense? I think it does. Yeah. Like all the stalls are taken. So you take the last stall, which happens to be handicapped, which means the handicapped person has to wait in line. Yeah. Much like everyone else. First, and it's exactly. also just at the time, the time is of importance here we're in how long you're in the bathroom stall one minute how long are you parking for two hours exactly which is why the handicapped ramp is at the complete other side of the spectrum anyone can use it anyone can use it because you're just you're not taking it up for any real amount of time yeah you know actually thinking about this um you know i was thinking about disability boarding for airplanes mm-hmm 
so I've recently flew Southwest for Christmas, which I don't use very, fly very often, but you know, there's a whole system of like line up, lining up. I hate that system. And I hate it too, because the gate agents exert no authority. I need you to be there telling everyone how to line up, you know? Well, yeah. I mean, that's like when I, the person with 50 items in the 10 items or less line. Exactly. It's like, line checker, this is your line. You're in the uniform. You're the authority. You have to step in. You have to save us all from ourselves. So uniforms. (laughs) The power of uniforms Mm -hmm. and clothing to make the man. Exactly. I mean, I feel like, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) so interesting because like you could be, you know, someone who society would value value your job as highly as others let's say a rocket scientist for versus a movie theater usher but Mm -hmm. you as the usher are the king of the movie theater you can kick people out yes do it more (laughs) i know do it more use that authority yeah (laughs) that's the thing i i want a firmer hand in society Uh, Obviously, you know that I think there should be a lot more shushing going on. And yeah, like, because we need rules in the society about cell phone use on trains Mm -hmm. and which side of the escalator to stand on. (laughs) People don't know there should be commercials. There should be there should have been a, a Super Bowl ad. Silence I don't know if that. I would go that far, but I do. Silence that texting noise on your phone. Yeah, they do that. And yet people, people always think, not me. I don't have my phone on ring. Check anyway, people. Now, Check anyway. I love the authority that, speaking of airports, that flight attendants, gay agents can and do wield. And how it really came out during the pandemic, I feel, because the people were really testing that authority and they would just say off the plane. Yeah, I love seeing those videos of someone behaving really badly on a plane. And then the flight attendant's like, I want her off. And they're like, what? Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Yeah, Yeah, because, you know, and that's the thing you you only need to make an example of a few people. Like I've always thought that if the city I live in started ticketing people who um annoy you ride electric bikes on the <laughs> sidewalk. Yeah. That they would only have to do that maybe one day a month. Uh-huh. On a couple street corners. And eventually it would start being like the red light, the the stop sign. Mm -hmm. you don't something you don't do right because what people do when they think that there's no consequences that's the thing authority and this is kind of the remarkable thing about god no consequences or so you think yeah just the threat of future consequence has proven (laughs) remarkably effective (laughs) and i guess having human agents of God to enforce social isolation and things like that. What do you mean? You know, like if you're part of a religious community and you um, have a baby out of wedlock, Uh you'll be sent into the woods. (laughs) Okay. Well, that's interesting. It's like, yeah, where the, obviously that doesn't happen now here, mostly. Um, <laughs> so the goalposts do move. Like you meant, made that little joke about my husband being my authority figure. Um, well, that's back. People are <laughs> into that now. Yeah, I guess it's back, but I actually don't, I don't know. Who knows? It's just being more, it's on display more. Yeah. Um, so authority can be eroded. I mean, the erosion, ha- ha- has the authority of the police been more eroded in the last five years certainly the moral authority 
Yeah. So were they ever considered a moral authority, though? I thought people were always kind of hated the police. No, not mainstream society. Not people who weren't targeted by the police, I guess. E- exactly. Yeah. And now even people who aren't targeted by the police think they're corrupt. Yeah. Like when I worked at Starbucks, we were instructed to give police officers in uniform free coffee. Right. Right. I wonder if they still do that. I bet they do. It's almost a little bribey. Yeah. yeah. We don't want any trouble here, officer. <laughs> yeah, just a free coffee. Unlimited. And then the erosion of authority of the government. I mean, has it ever been at this low level? All time low, like, well, how is the government asserting authority over us? Well, they like, make us pay taxes, they tell us, I mean, gas so costs, yeah. Like, are we not doing that? Are we not paying taxes more? I don't know. That's a good question. I guess it's like, think... yeah, if believe, if say, okay, yeah, like, if I don't believe the government is an entity that. I can trust, but I still fall in line with the government. Does it matter? Is that still perfect authority or strong authority? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I Yeah. I think that obedience is probably more, of more interest to the authority exerter yeah. than belief. But belief? Now, yeah. I mean, belief is important, too. Mm-hmm. In North Korea, they want both. <laughs> They want the belief and the obedience. (laughs) But yeah, it's like really crazy that every part of the world is a country. Well, there are small tribal communities, but yeah. I mean, they still live in a country, I guess. Something I think about a lot is how easy it must have been to get away with certain things in past times. Oh, I, I can't believe they ever, like, tried and convicted people. Well, I guess, yeah, the, the evidentiary standards were suitably lower to accommodate. <laughs> that, yes, exactly. You could not apply today's evidentiary standards to a medieval murder. Um, by the way, I gave up on the name of the rose. El nome de la rosa. You don't say. It was an international bestseller. I expected... A little more interesting from an international bestseller. That's true. It's so thick. Isn't it like this big? Yeah, it's quite thick. Quite dull. Too many characters who aren't easy to tell apart. Listen, if I'm reading a book that that's, that's this thick, it's not a bestseller. It's a classic, okay? Yeah. I'm getting... Well, you know what I'm reading now? Just a little aside. The Merchant of Venice. <gasps> that's my mom's favorite play. Really? Yeah. But I've heard I'll it's have to talk to her about it. Oh, yeah. It's a classic of anti-Semitism. <laughs> I felt like as a, it, it's intellectual Jews like to be conversant with it. I see. But yeah, it's quite interesting. I Shakespeare. Know. There's a classic for you. Yeah. that does Real canon. Fun. Real canon. But if you could only read one Shakespeare, it should be Hamlet probably, right? That's the canon. That's the one you submit to the Shakespeare would submit to the canon officers i think all of shakespeare is canon it is but you can only pick one if you can only pick one it's not it's, all canon it's all canon anthony and cleopatra yeah yeah it is but like some of them are about the tempest no you don't need to read the tempest it's all canon not everything is as famous or well loved it's like the bible is all canon but that doesn't necessarily mean that you know, every chapter in Leviticus describing sacrifices is a real, you know, home run. Sure. But the, the, I guess what I'm saying is what's the canon? Uh, what's the canon of the Shakespeare canon? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's always an interior canon. Any- I just like now that I'm a real scholar of the Bible. Oh, you're moving on. No, no. What I was going to say is that now that I'm a real scholar of the Bible and I read each Torah portion three times, twice in Hebrew, once in Aramaic translation, and with commentary. Wow, you're a real trad wife. I'm a real trad wife. I'm so aware now that when I read Shakespeare, I'm not getting it. Because what can you get from one reading? 
I know what you mean. Even reading Middlemarch, I'm like, I wonder what I'll get from this the next time I read it. Because we're just getting plot right now. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like you should just read five books in your life. <laughs> over and over again. Over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And then maybe shoot for a sixth. <laughs> okay, so the authority of books. Wait, weren't you on a different subject? Maybe, but we can be discursive, can't we? Uh, I hope it doesn't frustrate our audience, but yes, keep going. So Judaism ascribes a really high value to the authority of text and also the authority of, there's so many different sources of authority in Judaism. And we were learning something the other day about the reason why certain holidays are two days in the diaspora and only one day in Israel. It's because each month, each lunar month is either 29 or 30 days. And that determination would be made in Israel. And then it would take some time to get out to the extended, the outer neighborhoods back in the day, back in the, you know, first century CE. Sure. And then they ended up fixing the calendar. So now we have a fixed calendar. We know which months are 29 and which ones are 30. We mm -hmm. just predetermine it. And we still do this two-day holiday thing. And Maimonides wrote that it's because it be, a tradition acquires the force of law. And even if the reason for the tradition goes away, you still have to do it. Yeah, that's the thing. That's like stop signs. It's like the reason is to avoid car accidents, avoid hurting people, to have order and traffic. But if there's no other traffic, there's no point to the stop sign, but I still respect it. Yeah. It's like why, you know, what? at a certain point, one must ask why. One must question your relationship to, I think that's an important part of being like growing up and being a teenager and that rebellious stage. Like it in the end gives you a deeper, more meaningful, more thoughtful relationship to the symbols that you respect. Yes. And I find it very disturbing. It, it's hard. It's, it's very hard to navigate the right amount of authority to respect because you can become bogged down but there's something so rootless and empty about just being like fuck all of that it has nothing yeah. to do with me it's like no like there's there's a lot of beauty in in tradition and in like these ancient practices and part of their beauty is in taking them on, not just because you like them, but in taking them on as commitments for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. You know, not every time I pray, I'm in the mood to pray, but I've made this commitment on myself as a religious Jew mm -hmm. to do daily prayer. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to navigate. And I also think it's interesting with things like Judaism, which was this rebellion against paganism mm -hmm. so it was a rebellion against authority mm -hmm. and then, but it then you're all supposed own. to obey yeah and then it becomes its own authority and america was this rebellion against england <laughs> taxes <Did you> forget <laughs> you're like <laughs> you're like who colonized monarchy <laughs> monarchy and just saying like what was taxation it really about against represent no representation i don't know yeah taxes i don't know um the king um yes definitely an important balance because like on january 6th when all those people stormed the capitol i think much of us anyone sane agreed that that was too much <laughs> Yeah, but they were like, we're the Boston Tea Party, baby. Yeah, the delusions. The de the delusions, but also, oh, I feel like I'm about to say something so controversial, but I don't, I'm just, I don't really mean it. Okay. What did the British mainstream media think about the Boston Tea Party? Right, right. I don't support January 6th insurrection. Okay. <laughs> I think they were crazy. 
it's just in hindsight we see that the Boston Tea Party clown attacks was you know the Boston Party was an act of terrorism lest we forget did they kill people thought leaders I don't know does it have do you have to kill people if for it to be terrorism yeah no I think so I think otherwise it's just like vandalism and performance art terrorism you just caused terror who was terrified by that <laughs> well this the fish i Those guarantee you you don't have to up. kill someone for it to be terrorism no okay. no one died blowing blowing up like a, a state building even if it's empty is terrorism yeah um i guess it's i guess so it's not very terrifying i think the tarring and feathering is much more terrifying um yeah sure i mean yeah there's definitely a scale <laughs> of terrorism the less terrifying the more terrifying anyway but it was you, you're looking back okay these were like thought leaders at least not a single thought leader among those january 6th insurrectionists but who are we to say who's the authority on thought leadership and righteousness it's like history how yeah. it works out in the end yeah yeah i mean it's just so this hard is... because you start going down the road of like relativism and moral relativism. And it's just like, it's such a f- futile journey. Well, sometimes Circular. me and Yoav have these discussions and, and Yoav a very, um, sees things from all perspectives type mm-hmm. of person. Yeah. And he's always like, well, they don't see it that way. They see it this way. Mm-hmm. And I'm always like, yes. And they're wrong. <laughs> I know they see it that way, and that <laughs> is a wrong way to see it. And I, I, I think relativism is also a scale. I think that even with some sort of ability to be like, well, is January 6th the same as the Boston Tea Party? I, I do think that on some level it's possible to evaluate things and come to some sort of solid conclusion about legitimacy versus illegitimacy, even if you're like, but those January 6th people believed in it just as much. It's like, yeah, but what they believed in was QAnon, and that is objectively stupid. Yeah, agreed. They are, or they is are, it? They are dumber, I guess, is that my, that's my point. <laughs> They're dumber, that is your point. They're not reading John Locke. Now, I have been kind of in, deep in conspiracy theory Instagram reels lately. Oh, a bad place to be. I love it because what I'm really there for is spooky Instagram reels. That's my latest thing. Even if they're fake. I like to think that they're real sometimes. Okay, but what is Skinwalkers, the- yeah, ghosts. No, definitely not. Sometimes this found footage really is quite scary. I'm sure it's that scary. balloon. That balloon. Come on, that, that balloon, balloon was... was scary, but it's also nothing. But I guess you're just no. for the base level spooks. Oh my god, someone at my synagogue is a professional psychic. Oh really? Yeah, we're inviting him over for dinner. Oh fun. I thought maybe we could get him on the pod, but first I have to like develop a rapport. Yeah. So what were you saying? You're on conspiracy talk. Conspiracy talk, ghosts. I, I'm on a tangent, really. Oh, okay, okay. Well, do you want to talk about the uh, Milgram experiment? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Would Would you explain it? I will explain it. So this was an experiment done at Yale, I think, in the seventies. Um, and it's 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 a very famous experiment. Most of you have probably heard of it, but I'll explain anyway as a little refresher that. This man, Milgram, had an actor and a real person perform an experiment where the real person was told to give electric shocks to an actor. They didn't know it was an actor, though. They thought they were both um, subjects of the experiment every time that they got a memory question wrong. So they were shocking people, thinking they were shocking people. And these people were the actor. They couldn't see. They couldn't see them, but they could hear them. Yeah. And the actors, you know, were screaming, were begging for mercy. And 
the they were told the subjects were told to actually just keep increasing the um electric shocks and most people 65 percent of the subjects were willing to go up to the highest voltage um just because they were told in various different ways to by a man in a white coat yeah by they thought the man was running the experiment which he was and was telling them that they had to increase the voltage to the actors in order to complete the experiment. So the man in the white coat... He didn't coat, introduce himself as a doctor. He just wore a white coat. Did I say he was a doctor? Yeah, he didn't introduce himself as a doctor. I'm just saying. Oh, okay. I think it's interesting because, like, just the, the symbol of the white coat. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So this was supposed to demonstrate that authority can make average people do terrible things to each other just because they're told to. It was very much a post World War II. It was in dialogue with the Holocaust. Yes. Essentially they were trying to figure out how so many people were able to participate in the Holocaust and one theory was just was the you know the res- the way that you get ordinary people to comply with if you have authority to do even mm-hmm. terrible, terrible things. Yes. And it is a terrifying experiment. Yes. And there was also that other experiment, the the Stanford Prison Guard experiment. Yeah, but I think in subsequent years, they found out that that was actually not a very well done experiment. And in almost like it's basically the conclusions are null and void. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So and then the push. And then the push, which I think we've talked about on this one. We have? I think we have. Where <laughs> you want to explain it quickly. Yeah, the push is the the most significant TV show ever made that no one has ever seen except me. I've never found someone who's seen it. It's on <laughs> Netflix, right? I have no idea where you watched it. It's called The Push. The idea is that this guy is going to take an ordinary person and turn them into a murderer in one night. So you're a graphic designer. He tells this guy tells you, I, I have a job for you. You come, you meet him. At, he, he's busy. He's working in an event this night, some big award show. Oh, he's a higher up at this organization, blah, blah, blah. You go and meet him there. The whole environment is fake. Everyone there is an actor except for you. And he slowly, slowly starts exerting authority over you becoming more and more aggressively domineering. And eventually he tells you to kill someone. And like nine out of the 10 people who did the experiment killed the person. Obviously no one was murdered during the making of the show, but they pushed someone off of a roof thinking that they were killing someone, not aware that there was a net to catch them. Do you think the people who pushed have never thought about how terrible it would be to accidentally kill someone. Because, like, I think about that all the time, like, driving. Yeah, I feel like I'm so ready to not push someone. I'd be like, no. No, (laughs) I've run drills for this for years. I remember the first... I had a dream when I was a kid where I pushed a woman off a cliff. Is this real? Yeah. Oh. By accident. I, Uh like, bumped her off a cliff. And it was one of the most disturbing dreams. The guilt I felt was so overwhelming. And ever since then, it's been, as you know, a huge fear of mine accidentally causing grievous bodily harm to someone. Yeah, I mean, it should be a shouldn't be a big fear to anyone, but, you know, you should be aware of it. That's what I, I I mean, we all like to think we wouldn't push, right? We all like to think we wouldn't get to the highest voltage. That's the problem. I really think I wouldn't push. I think I might get to the highest voltage. Well, now, pretty much every person who was administering the the shocks, the subjects of the experiment, were hesitant and did not want to go on. But the um, experimenter, the person in the lab coat would say, please continue. And then if they were like, no, I like if they resisted again, they would get increasingly more forceful instructions from the experimenter. So the experiment requires that you can continue. 
or it is absolutely essential that you continue. And then finally, the last one they would get is you have no other choice. You must go on. Wow. Yeah. So it wasn't just like, just do it. And they're like, okay. It's like they're, they would be in dialogue with the experimenter being like, I don't want to do this. And they're being told that they have to. Yeah. I mean, I think like authority, you know, they I just also, listened to what I was. They also said that they're, they were also told the, it's, um, the subjects of the experiments, the one administering the shock, that they, the person receiving the shock would not suffer any la- lasting damage. So it's painful, but it's not, um, you know, permanent. That's why I think I would do it. I think, like, I don't think I would kill someone in the push, but I do think I could be convinced by a forceful, scary person in a lab coat to administer shocks if I was being reassured that it wouldn't cause right lasting harm right so i so yeah those people obviously they caused real harm but they believed that well actually they didn't but (laughs) they believed that they weren't causing lasting harm which which puts a different lens on how monstrous we think we're they are capable of being Mm -hmm. but one of the things i think I don't know if I've mentioned it on the show or not, but one of the greatest wisdom teachings I ever learned when I adopted a cat. Mm-hmm. You, yeah. You know this. It's one of my go-tos. It's a good And I thing. asked the person at the shelter, do you train cats? And she said, no. You set up the environment so that things go well for the cat. You don't train them. Morality is a society wide issue we cannot rely on good people to do good we need a society that sets up people to do good because people are really easily manipulated Mm -hmm. yeah i mean it was very easy there was no pre-established or you know pre-established authority that these people came into this experiment with which i think is the most interesting thing about it it didn't take long for the authority to be asserted. Now, yeah. obviously, there are key differences um, between this experiment and what happened in the Holocaust. Namely, that was, you know, they were <laughs> trying to wipe out an entire people versus mm-hmm. causing them temporary discomfort. But yeah, they knew what they were doing. Exactly. But they had longer amounts of time to wear these people down and to exert their authority to get them to be more obedient. Yes. Years and years and years of insidious manipulation. Yes. I just think it's actually very important for all of us to remember how easily manipulated we can be and to never think you're above that. Because what will keep you in check is recognizing how malleable our morality can be. Malleable. Mal, malleable. Yes, we need, we need to, that, that's the hope. The hope is that the generation, the post Milgram generation is a little less Milgram-y. But at the same time, it's like. Milgram's progress. (laughs) We are the post Milgram generation and people, and I think that we are a little bit, we are much more leery of authority or is that just age? Well. It's age. We're also witnessing a like global rise in authoritarianism. But is that, don't you think that that's sort of like just the world becoming more polarized? Between like free wheel in America and like. Yeah. And even within tough. our own society. Yeah, you have strong like more. The leftist movement, the strong right wing movement. Both movements are more visible than not ever. Yeah. In the last hundred years, let's say. Yeah, human, humans. Oh, it's tough stuff. We're always changing. That's a thing. Are we, or are we just always repeating ourselves? We might indeed be always repeating ourselves, but what I mean is that we're always in flux. So like the post-war liberal order, like it would have been fabulous if we just stayed there and like kept polishing it. (laughs) Like, I'm not saying it was perfect, but I'm saying, like, keep polishing it, keep working on it, like, 
keep the basic structure in place. But no, people become restless and want to change. And they have to like relearn horrible mistakes that other generations had already learned. Yeah, it's tough stuff. I mean, authoritarian regimes are terrible. I mean, rules for no reason, punitive rules. And that's I mean, like insane. the whole like, like some of these the, some of these horrible dictatorships were just so outrageously insane. It's it's just crazy to me that one person was able to have such silly thoughts and then make them into reality <laughs> in these countries. Yeah. I guess I'm no, thinking you... of like hmm, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. My thought was a little a little discursive. Mine was about like the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Like everyone had to wear a uniform. They made they somehow got everyone to leave the cities and become farmers. It's like, wow, that's like a madman's idea that he was able to put into action. Yeah. Wow. Now, were the uniforms red? I think they were kind of I think they were gray. <laughs> um, do you think the the past, like again, like the like obviously in the mid middle ages you had really strict hierarchies but there's something about today with our technology our ability to govern people at the individual level each person can be governed and tracked and mm. ruled over mm -hmm. do you think the past was less authoritarian than the present that's such a good question i mean i guess it would just be different it's like you had no way of changing your social status that you were born into yeah and your obligations were very like you know had real implications like you don't farm you don't eat kind of thing yeah but it's not like people did people want to change it it's like those options just didn't exist you couldn't be like you marry the butler and i'll be a gay octomom <laughs> you know like those so, like did they feel constricted it's not like a, a young billy elliot in 1472 was like i want to dance he didn't know what dancing was and there um, were, if, yeah i think there, they felt like wow if only i had been born to that bit in that big manor house and here i am tilling the soil mm, yeah they had that, to like, have thought that yeah that one big manor house yeah so I was sleeping on this bed of hay with eight members of my family being eaten by bugs yeah, exactly. But there was no meritocracy, which made us obsessed with like climbing social ladders. So maybe there was sort of a degree of contentedness that we mm -hmm. don't have today. Yeah. But more authority. I think it was in your day in, in the day to day life of an average person, I think maybe less because they didn't have a manager asking you where you were all day. Right? There was no manager. I guess we're talking about this like one slice of history, though, like feudal, poor white people in the feudal system of England. And yeah, that's France. what we're talking about. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, but I also know. like when you read like old codes of Jewish law, they talk about like traveling. Mm -hmm. And when you traveled from place to place, there was usually a long stretch of time on your trip when you were between places and you were not in a place. Mm -hmm. And that was an incredibly dangerous time because there were brigands on the road mm. and no one to stop them. Yeah. Robbers, thieves, pirates. Yeah. Our world is so... Now, obviously, I don't want to go back to that, but there's something a little bit just disturbing about the fact that society, and we've talked about this before, society has no margins. There's no, you you have to be a part of it. Like There's, It's so hard to opt out. It's like, it's almost illegal to opt out. It's illegal to opt out. And I think that's probably like part of the fascination with uncontacted tribes. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Like, forget uncontacted tribes. I think it's amazing that there, there are no wild humans, just no language, 
no feral hill ch- humans yeah like that our system of society is so total that yeah. 100% of all how many people are there 8 billion i think 8 billion <laughs> 7.8 billion yeah all 8 billion none of them are just like feral in the woods somewhere right mhm amazing I mean, I think there are there are some people who live in the woods off the grid, but yeah. There are people who live in the woods off the grid, but they have language, they have society, they have... Yeah. Um, no one is feral. Right. Besides those feral children. Yeah. Um, but even they now. live in society. Anyway. <laughs> Eventually. Um, okay, well, what do you think about it? What are your closing thoughts on authority? Is it how to be? What? I think that... Um, there are times in life where you have to break the shackles and times in life where it's good to weave threads of authority to take on some, some real commitments to things that are bigger than us. And I think each person needs to ask themselves what they could use a little more of, because if you're really bogged down with authority, you might need to go break free, quit your job, go buy a house in Tuscany. But if you are someone who's been living this rootless postmodern life, then maybe consider joining the Church of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I agree. I think it's important to question your relationship with authority um, and uh, question really everything you do in life. Um, why you're stopping at that stop sign and concluding for yourself why it's a good thing to do. I believe in the stop sign. I'm grateful we have them. Um, you know, I, I but do not go blindly into that corporate retreat, okay? Mm-hmm. Because <laughs> some of this is just a bunch of bullshit and you have to play along, but your heart doesn't have to be in it. Yeah. Okay, Matt, always a pleasure. Yeah, that was fun. Okay. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye.